In this unit, we're going to take another look at synthesizing alcohols using organometallic compounds as one of our starting materials. Those organic metallic compounds being things like organolithium compounds that have a carbon-lithium bond or Grignard reagents that have a carbon-magnesium bond. In this unit, we're going to focus on reacting those organometallic compounds with molecules that have a carbonyl group bonded to a heteroatom, such as esters, for example, that have a carbonyl group directly bonded to an oxygen and an alkyl group. So let's take a look at how that impacts the reaction of the synthesis of alcohols. Let's go ahead with that. So just a throwback to what we were looking at in the last segment. In the last segment, we took uh, organometallic compounds, such as the Grignard reagent that we see here, and we used that carb anion character, the fact that that carbon is very, very negatively polarized, to allow that carbon to act as a nucleophile and come over and attack the electrophilic carbonyl carbon, forcing the pi electrons up onto the oxygen and giving us the following intermediate. We form the new carbon-carbon bond shown in red by having that nucleophilic carbon attack the electrophilic carbonyl. And then from there, we're a simple short protonation step away by adding acid to the reaction mixture to cap off that oxygen anion with our proton to leave us with a hydroxy group in the final product. And so there we have our final product. The reason I wrote this out is we're gonna contrast this with the mechanism that will take place if instead of starting with an aldehyde or a ketone, which is what we started with here, because we defined our R groups as carbons or hydrogens, if instead of that we start with an ester molecule in our starting structure. So let's take a look at that situation. So what I've done here is started our problem by starting with the same Grignard reagent that we did in the last example, but now rather than mixing that Grignard reagent with a ketone or aldehyde, instead we're mixing it with an ester, which is another example of a carbonyl containing functional group or a carbonyl group directly next door to an O alkyl group. So that R group here, our R prime group, absolutely has to be an alkyl group in order for this to meet the definition of an ester. We have to have an O alkyl group there at the end, and that's gonna be important to the outcome of this reaction. So what will it happen here? Well, the first thing we would expect in the mechanism is totally analogous to what we saw up top, where our carbon is very eager to react as a nucleophile. So it's gonna come over and attack the electrophilic carbonyl carbon, forcing the pi bond up onto the oxygen and giving us this product. Now in this product that I've drawn here, the new carbon-carbon bond is in red. And what distinguishes this product from up top is that rather than having a carbon-hydrogen bond or a carbon-carbon bond, instead what we have is a carbon-oxygen bond right here. And that's important because when we have an O alkyl group like this, that represents a relatively good leaving group because of the fact that oxygen is a relatively electronegative atom and under these basic conditions, it will be favorable for that carbon-oxygen bond to break. So the carbon-oxygen bond breaks like so, taking the electrons with the oxygen to make an oxygen anion. At the same time that that happens, so we can fill the octet for as many atoms as possible, what we can do is move the lone pair electrons down from the oxygen to reform that pi bond. So the fact that we have a good leaving group here, once we have created this intermediate, that OR leaving group, what that is going to enable to happen is this reforming of the carbonyl group with the loss of that oxygen and the R double prime as our leaving group. So we'll go ahead and reform our carbonyl. We've lost that OR group where R double prime is defined as an alkyl group and we still have that CR3 there. So we connect the CR3 where those Rs now are carbons or hydrogens. And then at this point, what you will see is that now we have, as our product of this reaction, a ketone. And the reason that we have a ketone product here rather than an alcohol product is, again, going back to the fact that our intermediate here has a suitable leaving group. It has a leaving group, that OR group, that once it breaks away is relatively stable. Whereas if we were comparing that to the situation with aldehydes or ketones, when we get to this point right here in the reaction mechanism, there are no good O alkyl leaving groups. So just R, R, 
CR3. We can't break readily carbon hydrogen bonds or carbon carbon bonds because the products of that breakage would be unstable. So therefore, that intermediate just sits around until a proton comes into its life to form the alcohol final product. On the other hand here, at the bottom case scenario with an ester, we have that leaving group available. And so that leaving group is going to break away here in the intermediate to allow the carbonyl group to reform, making a ketone. Now ketones are also susceptible to reaction with Grignard reagents. So if we have a second equivalent of Grignard reagent available, then what's going to happen is the reaction can continue. So if there's a second equivalent of our Grignard reagent, that is our organomagnesium compound, then what will happen is we'll bring that second equivalent of Grignard reagent in, so CR3, with a lone pair of electrons on that carbon to enable it to act as our nucleophile here. It comes over, attacks the carbonyl carbon, forcing the pi bond up onto the oxygen, and from here on out, this mechanism is gonna look extremely similar to what we saw up top as our reaction of a Grignard reagent with an aldehyde or ketone. So let's go ahead and finish this out. So we have our ketone skeleton that I'm redrawing, except that the carbonyl has now become a single bond to an oxygen anion. And our new bond I'm going to show in red, that's the new carbon-carbon bond here. And that carbon-carbon bond is connected to our CR3 group, which served as the nucleophile going into this step of the reaction. So there we go from there. And then this, this final compound out of this step is just going to sit around and wait until we acidify the solution. Because at this point, we have no way to reform the carbonyl group here because doing so would require that we break a carbon-carbon bond or a carbon-hydrogen bond to one of those R groups, and that is not gonna happen because that would not yield a product that's stable at all. So this just hangs out waiting around until we add acid to the solution, at which point that oxygen is going to pick up a proton. So let's go ahead and finish up this reaction. So our product here, our final, final product that we're drawing out is gonna to correspond to adding two equivalents of Grignard reagent to one ester starting material. And we'll have an alcohol here. And you'll notice that in the end scenario, we've created two new carbon-carbon bonds to here and to here, connecting to the two nucleophiles right here and here that we were working with in the mechanism. So the thing to keep in mind is that when you're reacting an ester that has a good leaving group, that oxygen atom, bonded to it, that you have to incorporate this extra extra twist into the reaction where the leaving group leaves as the carbonyl group reforms to give us a ketone. And then if we do have additional Grignard reagent available, that ketone is gonna keep on reacting down the road to do the addition of the nucleophile to that ketone to give us ultimately our final product here. So let's look a little bit more at this theme where we have a nucleophil nucleophilic carbon attacking a carbonyl group, in which instance that carbonyl group is also bonded to a good leaving group, such as a chlorine atom. So we're gonna take a look at this reaction and try to walk through how to get to the product. So look at our reagents. First thing to keep in mind and remember is that the pH stands for a phenyl group, P-H-E-N-Y-L, which refers to an aromatic ring branch. So it's a six-membered ring with alternating single and double bonds that we can abbreviate as a hexagon with a circle inside of it. I'm just putting a squiggly line here to connect that to the rest of the molecule. So phenyl, magnesium bromide, would correspond to this aromatic ring, directly bonded to magnesium and bromine. So when we're thinking about how this is actually going to behave in terms of the reaction and what we're actually interested in out of this, we're interested in the aromatic ring and the fact that we can treat that bond here between carbon and magnesium as a highly polarized bond with the carbon taking the lion's share of electrons there and having a negative formal charge essentially. So what will happen is that that carb anion will act as a nucleophile coming over, it looks like it's traveling a really long distance here to get over to our carbonyl carbon, which is positively polarized and that positively polarized carbonyl carbon, once it's attacked by the nucleophile, the electrons from that pi bond are gonna come up onto the oxygen, and that's going to give us our intermediate here. So I'll go ahead and draw out that intermediate right down here. I'm redrawing what was originally our 
acyl halide. And we call it an acyl halide because it has the carbonyl group with an alkyl group on it, and that's direct. the carbonyl group is directly bonded to a chlorine. So go ahead and redraw all of this, plugging in our new carbon-carbon bond in blue. And I'm just going to abbreviate that aromatic ring as a pH group, a phenol group. And now here, at this stage of the reaction, we're set up similarly to the second step of the reaction with an ester, where we've formed a new carbon-carbon bond, we have an oxygen anion directly bonded to a carbon that is also bonded to a good leaving group, that chlorine, because if we break the carbon-chlorine bond, that's going to leave us with a chloride anion, which is even more stable than an oxygen anion, because chlorine is more electronegative than oxygen. So indeed, we'll break away that chlorine atom at the same time that the carbonyl group reforms in order to give us a ketone as the next intermediate in this reaction. So we're going to reform the carbonyl group. We have an ethyl group bonded to that, and our phenyl group, our six-membered ring directly bonded to there. And we will also, at this point, have ejected a chloride anion. So we'll go ahead and plug that in. Then from here, we are given the information that we have an excess of phenyl magnesium bromide. And what that means is all the equivalents that we would possibly need to take the reaction as far down the road as possible. So we can assume that there is another unit of phenyl magnesium bromide there. In other words, there's another aromatic ring with one of the carbons of the aromatic ring bearing that essentially a lone pair of electrons to act as a nucleophile. So that nucleophile is going to come in, attack the ketone, forcing the pi bond to go up onto the oxygen. And we will go ahead and draw out the intermediate resulting from that, including, most interestingly, the fact that we've made a new carbon-carbon bond right here. So we'll go ahead and plug in our phenyl group. And then finally, now that we have no leaving groups left here, so there's no way for us to bring the electrons down to reform the carbonyl as a leaving group breaks away, because all we have now are carbon-carbon bonds at that carbons. We can't reform the carbonyl group. Instead, what we do is wait around until we add the acid, which we list adding there second. So we wait around, add the acid, which I'll just put in as H+. Lone pair electrons come over, form a covalent bond to that acid, and give us our final product, which corresponds to both converting a uh, carbonyl group into an alcohol group during the outcome of this reaction as well as installing two new carbon-carbon bonds to phenol groups. So our final product, if that was what you were asked to provide here, would be this guy right here. Our two new carbon-carbon bonds are shown in blue, there and there, and we've also installed the hydroxy group as a result of this reaction. So now we move on to our next example, where we have a carbonyl group right here, directly bonded to what we might recognize as a decent leaving group, an OH group. So we could perhaps envision that one thing we might do is have the nucleophile attack the electrophilic carbon atom there, and then secondly, the leaving group breaking away. However, in this particular situation where we start with a carboxylic acid, we have to keep in mind that Grignard reagents are not only nucleophiles, they are also super strong bases. So this Grignard reagent that we plug in here can act as both a nucleophile and as a base. And it will generally act as a base if there's a source of proton that can be abstracted or removed from the organic reactant. And so bases that we see here are going to react very quickly generally relative to the rate at which the nucleophile would react. And so what would happen is that if we have an organic reactant that has a hydrogen on a heteroatom, it's going to very quickly remove that rather than acting as a nucleophile. So this is going to perform the role of abstracting a proton from what we call heteroatom hydrogen bonds. So it's going to very quickly remove protons from OH, SH, NH, etc. Because of the fact that it is able to act as a base and the acid-base reaction is faster 
than the reaction of it as a nucleophile. And so here, in the case of a carboxylic acid, this is a tricky question because we want to think that the carboxylic acid is going to react analogously to the ester and the acyl chloride that we saw above. But in actuality, what's going to happen here, since we have this OH group, is that instead the Grignard reagent is going to act as a base to deprotonate that rather than acting as a nucleophile and attacking here. So to think about the major organic product of this reaction, the product of step one would just be that the Grignard reagent would act as our base. So we can take CH3, lone pair of electrons essentially on the carbon, and we will take that lone pair of electrons on the carbon, bring it over to grab this proton. That forces the oxygen-hydrogen bond to break and those electrons to go onto the oxygen to give us, as a result of this first step, oxygen anion there. like so, as well as CH4 methane. And then this is just going to wait around in solution because there's nowhere for this to go until we do step two, which we're acidifying the solution at step two. So when we acidify the solution, that means we're adding an excess of protons. And so that oxygen anion then will be able to act as a base and pick up that proton. So that will actually end up leading us right back to where we started with our organic molecule. So we will have accomplished absolutely nothing in terms of changing the structure of our carboxylic acid and going from beginning to end here. Because at the beginning, our Grignard reagent, due to the fact that it is both a nucleophile and a base, is actually going to act as a base here. Because when we look at what's present in the organic reaction mixture, we do have a heteroatom bonded to a hydrogen. And so that's going to enable that carb anion to act as a base rather than as a nucleophile. So when you think about carboxylic acids reacting with organometallic compounds, don't expect those to enable the formation of a new carbon-carbon bond. Instead, expect them to just undergo acid-base reactions. So with, that we, so with that we conclude our discussion of using organometallic compounds to attack carbonyl groups in order to create new carbon-carbon bonds and yield alcohol products.